to the second annual J. Nathan Visiting Scholars Lecture Series. My name is Jeff Welsh. I'm a professor of history at the University of Scranton, and I will serve as tonight's moderator for tonight's panel discussion and an artistic performance entitled Mongolia, History, Culture, and Transformation. Uh, last night, I was on an airplane flying back to Pennsylvania, and as you know, while you're on the plane, you find yourself looking for things to do. And so I took out a piece of paper, and across the top of the piece of paper, I wrote three words. History, culture, and transformation. Under history, I wrote one word, Temujin. For most of you in this room, that name doesn't ring any bells, but if I told you that this is also a name for Genghis Khan, you probably would know exactly what I'm talking about, who in the 12th century formed the largest contiguous land empire in world history, stretching from the present day Ukraine in the west, to Korea in the east, from Siberia in the north, to the Gulf of Oman, and Vietnam in the south. Under culture, I wrote three concepts. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Nomadism, and the three manly games of the Dalai. In 1640, the entire Mongolian population embraced by Buddhism and remained the predominant The fall of communism in 1990 began rose to become the most widely practiced religion of Mongolia. According to the 2010 census, 61.4% of Mongolians claim Buddhism as a religion of choice. Uh, throughout much of Mongolian history, the inhabitants have either been pastoral or horse nomads. And again, in the 1910, I mean, 2010 census, 30% of the population is still classified as either nomadic or semi-nomadic. The Three Manly Games of Adam is a national summer festival consisting of archery, wrestling, and horse racing, but not western style horse racing. This is long stretches of racing over, over open countryside. And then when it came to transformation, I identified two key ideas. The first was 1990 to 1992, and the second was the wolf economy. Between 1990 and 1992, Mongolia underwent a peaceful, democratic revolution. The country wrote a new constitution, introduced a multi-party system, and began the transition to a market economy. That market economy, in turn, led Renaissance Capital in 2009 to write into this report, Mongolia, Blue Sky Opportunity, that Mongolia was set to become the new Asian tiger, or the Mongolian wolf and predict unstoppable economic growth as a result of recent developments and foreign interest in the mining industry. Of course, my view is from 30,000 feet. Tonight I am joined by four distinguished panelists who I am sure will expand on my somewhat aerial commentary. Please let me briefly introduce them to you before I provide a more detailed introduction of each speaker. The first person uh, directly to my left is Dr. Alton Kaltel, Bogal is excellently the ambassador extraordinaire and plenipotentiary of Mongolia to the United States. Thanks to him. <laughs> Next to him is Dr. Saren Alden Begmar, the Mongolian language and cultural instructor at the Foreign Services Institute of the U.S. State Department. <laughs> uh, next is Ata Sonem Sadin a consultant and manager of international programs and projects. <laughs> and last, Dr. <laughs> a little more about our first speaker, uh, Dr. Altang Atel. In addition to serving as ambassador to the U.S., has also served as the non-resident ambassador of Mongolia to Israel and Mexico. During Mongolia's transition from Soviet-style rule, he was involved in re-establishing the country's foreign policy apparatus for the new government. His career includes being a member of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims of the International Criminal Court. In 1992, he was a visiting fellow for international law and international public affairs at Columbia University. His PhD is in international law from the Kiev National University in Ukraine. Tonight's presentation, Mongolia's Transition, Opportunities and Challenges.
Good evening, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Professor Jeffrey. centrally planned economy to market-oriented economy. <clears throat> this transformation process has been happening in the last quarter century. Indeed, Mongolia is celebrating today's 25th anniversary of Mongolian democracy. <clears throat> Having said this, I would like to briefly introduce my country and history. Mongolia is a country with rich tradition of culture and customs. Mongolia and Mongolians enjoy the country's natural beauty and the way of life we live for centuries. Mongolia is a country with a rich history and the statehood. As you know, our history witnessed ups and downs. Historians consider that Mongolian statehood dated back to more than 2,200 years with the establishment of the Hong Empire. <clears throat> In the 13th century, Genghis Khan established the largest land empire on the earth, which lasted 150 years. During his and his successes <clears throat> reign, Peace was restored, free trade was flourished, faith in the religion had been respected, law was abided, and justice was served. However, once powerful Mongols' internal struggle and zeal for power weakened the empire, particularly after the fall of the Yuan dynasty, in 1368. After Chinggis Khan's death, the empire was subdivided into four kingdoms, which eventually became quasi-independent, which became the source of struggle for power and partition of the country into smaller kingdoms. At the end of 16th century, Mongolia was subjugated to Manju's Qing dynasty. This painful period lasted for more than 150 years of isolation. Internal fighting among successive kings had been blamed mostly for the fall of the empire. With the collapse of the Manju's Qing dynasty in 1911, Mongolia became independent and the head of Buddhist religion was installed as the head of a state. You can imagine that the times at the dawn of the 20th century was chaotic and turbulent. With the support of communist Russia, Mongolia became a socialist country with only party ruling and the state planned economy. This unfree time under communism lasted for full 70 years until 1990s. <clears throat> In winter of 1990, the year of the White House by lunar calendar, Mongolians had been out to the Ulaanbaatar Central Square demanding for freedom and liberty. Power transfer was peaceful. My president, one of the leaders of demonstrators, one of the founding fathers of Mongolian democracy, now says proudly that, I quote, our revolution didn't break a single window and not a single drop of blood was shed. 
end of quote. It is indeed the case. <clears throat> so that is how Mongolia embarked on the path to democracy. Since then, my country in the landlocked state between Russia and China held seven successful free and multi-party elections. The first democratic constitution was adopted in 1992. While the simultaneous political and economic transition had been taking place in the country, Mongolia earned the support of the international community. Mongolia's international relations have been expanding and its reputation in the world affairs is increasing. <clears throat> At the end of 1980s, Mongolia established diplomatic relations with the United States and the Republic of Korea and many other Western countries. Mongolia became a full member of many prestigious international financial institutions, uh, including World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and the Asian Development Bank. <clears throat> we call the countries and the international institutions who support and help Mongolia's transition to democracy and market-oriented economy our third neighbors. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to spend a few minutes to talk about our economy. My, my country has vast mineral wealth, which with proper management could turn the nations into wealthy country. I would like to take some example. <clears throat> some proven reserves is of uh, 2014. Mongolia has 80 3 million tons copper reserves. We have 18 billion tons reserve of coal. We have coal reserve 2,500 tons. We have enough proven reserves, zinc, iron, ore, uranium. And Mongolia's reserve rear was 30 three million tons. It is equal to 17% of world known reserve. This is second reserve, the second biggest reserve after China. <clears throat> Mongolia has conventional crude oil, 2,500 million barrel. <clears throat> Still we are exploring and making investigation for oil, especially in South Kobe area in Mongolia. <clears throat> Mongolia has enjoyed high rate of economic growth in the recent years. We have highest GDP growth in 2011. The time we had GDP growth 17.5%, it was one of the highest in the world. <clears throat> Last year, we had, we had uh, GDP growth 8%. <clears throat> Foreign direct investment plays a crucial role in the Mongolian economy. And successive governments work hard to create favorable and attractive environment for our investors. So I would like to tell you that Last more than 10 years, China invested to Mongolia 3.6 billion US dollars and Singapore 6,000 million, 600 million US dollars. And I would like to tell you during this time, the United States invested 300 million US dollars to Mongolia because the legal environment, legal uh, basis for the foreign investors in Mongolia is very favorable. And that's why we are attracting the foreign investors to Mongolia. The economic outlook for Mongolia is encouraging because huge mining operations, 
such as copper and gold mine Oyu Tolgo, and another it is coal mine Tawan Tolgo, are being undertaken. These two projects, Oyu Tolgo and Tawan Tolgo, it very important for the Mongolian economy and strengthening our economic capability. Oyu Tolgo project, it is estimated to be the second largest copper deposit in the world after the Escondido copper mine in Chile. This um, contract was signed in 2009 between the Mongolian government and the Rio Tinto <coughs> group. And the operation and production started in 2013, two years ago. <coughs> and we are now talking about, the, uh, about to start uh, underground mining. I, be, I think this negotiation is very successful and we will start the underground mining process it, 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 this is spring. <coughs> and this uh, mining, uh, you know, has uh, copper reserve 37 million tons and uh, gold reserve 1,300 tons. This is one of the biggest, I mentioned that it is the second biggest uh, such kind of mining in the world. The another the biggest project, it is a Tawan Tolgo project. This is a mining, cooking coal mining. It is estimated to be world's largest deposit of cooking coal. And the government uh, organized the tender on this project last December and the uh, consortium of the companies from China, Japan and Mongolia was winner in this tender and now the negotiations between the consortium and the Mongolian government is very actively now taking place and uh, we are uh, fully hope that the negotiations will be over in the come months. <coughs> this is a very important big mining project for our uh, economy. And uh, the reserve of this uh, mining, coal mining, uh, estimated 7.4 billion tons coal. I said it is the biggest coal deposit in the world. And expected to produce uh, 30, 35 million tons per year. <clears throat> so we have uh, successes. We have, uh, at the same time, we are facing challenges. And sometimes the investment is declining, mineral export is weakened, we should avoid the natural resource course that has afflicted some other resources in rich countries. So we need, in these cases, of course, we need uh, to diversify our economy, economic structure, which now relies excessively on the income from mineral resources and single market. It is very important to say you openly that uh, China alone accounts for 90% of Mongolia's exports. One third of imports and uh, almost 30% of foreign direct investment. And that's why the diversi diver diversification of the economic structure is very, very important. <clears throat> I would like, I mentioned that Mongolia it is a landlocked country uh, locating between China and Russia. Even though landlocked, landlockedness has negative impact on trade and transportation. But we think this location is a strategic location between China and Russia. It, it gives some opportunity and makes it market-linking country because 
China's economy right now it is the second biggest economy. Russian, uh, Russian, Russia's economy it is the sixth biggest economy in the world. But this is very big market, and uh, we have rich natural resources. We have very big market, uh, uh, very close, very big market uh, to Mongolia. We must use this opportunity, and we must use this market together with our foreign investors. So it is, it is one of the attractive factors for attracting of the foreign investors and developing of uh, Mongolian economy. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, trade between Europe and Asia is growing. And uh, recently, our neighbors, China and Russia, agreed to realize Mongolia-China and Mongolia-Russia transit agreements during the visit of Chinese president uh, last year, last uh, in August, and the Russian president visited Mongolia in September last year. And during this visit, we signed, with, especially with China's different kind of economic agreements, especially we signed uh, four <coughs> agreements on regulation of transit uh, with China. Uh, and uh, we are now using only one uh, seaport in China in Tianjin, and now according to the signed agreement, we are able to use another more for seaports in China. So it gives more opportunity for our uh, transition of goods to third country, not only to China and to other Asian countries, especially to South uh, Korea and Japan. <coughs> At the same time, I mentioned about uh, two main uh, projects in mining. And also, Mongolia, uh, besides these two projects, we have, we are expecting to implement the biggest infrastructure projects in Mongolia. And we are ex now expecting to construct uh, 2,000 kilometers new railways corridor which estimated 5 billion US dollars. And 1,000 kilometers highways, estimating 2.5 billion dollars. We are expecting to construct local roads, 5,000 kilometers, estimating also 2.3 billion US dollars. Big housing project in implementation, which is estimating 6.5 five billion US dollars. <coughs> we are expecting to implement industrial park project in South Gobia, which is estimating 12 and 14 billion US dollars. And we are expecting to construct two power stations, one in the capital city and another in South Gobia, which is estimating 3.5 billion US dollars. So, <coughs> Sorry. So, except the mining projects, we have very big infrastructure projects, which is also very attractive for the foreign investors. <coughs> I would like to say a few words about our foreign policy. Mongolia has, and we pursue peaceful, open, independent foreign policy. We have maintaining our diplomatic relations with more than 75 countries, 175 countries. Our foreign policy priorities are to maintain friendly relations and balanced relations with our two neighbors. This is very important because balanced relations with two our neighbors 
as you know, it is a two giants, very big economy. And Mongolia is located like sandwich between these two big giants. And so this <coughs> balanced foreign policy, balanced relationship with our two neighbors, very, very important. And the second priority, of course, our relation with our so-called third neighbors. This is, I already mentioned, it is a Western developed country. It is an international uh, organizations, economic, financial institutions. So this is very, very important second priorities. We really uh, determined to expand our partnership in the relations with our third neighbors. And we, of course, uh, another our priority in foreign policy uh, to develop, to work closely with the country of our region, I mean the region of Asia Pacific region. And the last priority in our foreign policy uh, to develop and uh, to, to have a very active foreign policy in international arena, especially, I think, in the multilateral directions. <coughs> and uh, relations with China and Russia are very important, I told that. Otherwise, you know, nobody cho chooses its neighbors, these are our neighbors for life. And that's why the policy is, is regards of our two neighbors, very, very important. And uh, we would like really, you know, uh, to develop uh, peaceful, uh, neighborly relations with two countries. And uh, I mentioned that last year, the Russian president and Chinese president visited Mongolia very successful visit because we concluded several important economic agreements with China especially. And first time last year in September, we organized by the initiative of Mongolian president, we organized trilateral summit <coughs> between the three countries. So this is first uh, trilateral summit in history of Mongolia with our two neighbors. Very important, very important in our foreign policy. So we are giving and trying to develop our, especially economic relation with our two neighbors. I don't want to take more of your time on the subject, <coughs> our relations with our two neighbors. Uh, a few words uh, regarding the third neighbor policy of Mongolia. This is very important because uh, Mongolia is now, <clears throat> we are determined uh, to create a new society based on knowledge and technology. And we really need uh, new technology. And uh, we really need educated people. So that's why we are giving great importance is our relationship is third neighbor country, I mean uh, Western developed country. This is including, of course, United States. Of course, uh, <clears throat> they, from the very beginning, this third neighbor country, Western developed country, they have and they supported us. They supported our democracy and our development. And they help Mongolia to develop. They invest in Mongolia. They bring modern technology to Mongolia. They help to de develop skills and entrepreneurship in Mongolia. All in all, they facilitate to realize Mongolia's desire to build, I said before, that a society based in on knowledge and modern and sophisticated technology. <clears throat> and we all share democratic values. We aspire for freedom and liberties, respect human rights. This is our common value with this country, I mean with the third neighbor country. 
And Mongolia is keen to develop deep political economic cooperation with our third neighbors. And it is indeed happening. Uh, maybe I would like to tell some of examples, uh, uh, because uh, Mongolia, uh, I said, uh, third neighbor, it is not only countries, it is also international institutions and organizations. And <clears throat> during this time, we uh, signed a very important agreement with the United States, the agreement on transparency. And last uh, December, we signed the free trade, first free trade agreement with Japan. So it is very, very important. And Mongolia became the member of World um, Trade Organization WTO in uh, 1907. And uh, we also became the member of Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And Mongolia signed in 2013 Partnership and Cooperation Agreement with the European Union. This is very, very important legal basis uh, for development of our bilateral relations with our third neighbor countries and also international uh, economic institutions. Few words about our relation with the United States. Uh, we established diplomatic relation in 1987 in the it is now uh, only 78 years after establishing diplomatic relations. I, I don't would like to say history uh, establishing of the diplomatic relation between the two countries, because it is very uh, long history. It is also very complicated history. But it is wonderful when Mongolia is used, already Mongolia orientated on market economy, and we already planning to choose democracy. And uh, this time in 19, 1987, we established diplomatic relations with, with the United States. <clears throat> and of course, we are very, very, very grateful to the United States and people of the United States for the support for Mongolia's successful transition uh, to the market economy. <clears throat> I would like to tell you that uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, Mongolia Compact was signed in <coughs> 2008 and very successfully uh, implemented, accomplished in 2013. And the uh, United States invested over 2,085 million uh, US dollars in Mongolia, accordingly to this project. And we are very happy that we, uh, again, Mongolia selected last December for the second compact agreement. And we, are, we have now very active, intensive negotiations with the American administration to conclude, to finalize this agreement, which is very important for Mongolian economy. Today, Mongolia and the United States enjoy solid political and legal basis for our economic ties. We considering the United States uh, is the most important of our third neighbors. Our troops serve together in Iraq and now in Afghanistan. Our peacekeepers also are together in the conflict in African continent. <clears throat> Our two countries are developing comprehensive partnership based on common values and shared strategic interests. We are committed to address our shared economic security and development interests through multilateral institutions in the Asia Pacific. We united our interests in protecting and promoting freedom, democracy, and human rights worldwide. I mentioned that uh, 
we signed very important transparency agreement in 2013. And we signed also trade and investment agreement 2014. I think for economic ties, we have very, very solid legal uh, basis. <coughs> is of today the United States United States is our fourth largest trading partner with half billion US dollars in total trade turnover. The United States direct investment reached to United States uh, 300 US dollars, making it, however, only eighth largest investor to Mongolia. We indeed need to increase this number. U.S. Uh, biggest companies, famous companies, such as General Electric, Peabody Energy, Fluor, Bechtel, and many others are active in Mongolia. They have, they opened uh, office in Mongolia. They are really, have really interests to develop business, economic and trade, investment relations with Mongolia. <coughs> And this is, again, I would like to tell you that uh, our uh, relations with your country is very, very good and excellent. And exchanging every year very high level delegations. I would like to say to you that President Bush visited Mongolia. And I think uh, during these 20 years, five of Secretary of State visited Mongolia very top level Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of uh, Energy, and the other high level delegations visited Mongolia. Famous senators and congressmen visiting every year Mongolia. This is very, very important because exchange of high level, top level delegations uh, giving big inputs and big uh, actions for developing our bilateral relations. It is also proof that how the two countries' relation is developing intensively. <clears throat> and uh, this is, you know, my uh, uh, remarks on Mongolian um, transition and very short uh, remarks on our bilateral relation. And I was, uh, I know that I have very limited time. Uh, I was informed I must use 25 minutes and I already used this uh, time. <clears throat> and uh, again, I would like to say thank you very much for your kind attention and thank you very much for uh, your invitation host me in, in this great university and uh, great university and I visited I have short tour uh, to your campus it was one of the greatest campus you know which I visited uh, before it it is wonderful and very modern very you know facilities especially I very much like and campus is wonderful thank you very very much Thank you, sir. A little bit of uh, commentary on how we're going to handle the Q&A. Uh, you were each handed a 3x5 card when you walked in the door. 
Uh, during the course of the presentations, we're going to ask that you write your questions down on the 3 by 5 card. They'll be collected uh, at the end of Dr. Nathan's presentation, and they'll be handed to me, and then I will ask the panelists your questions. Uh, so uh, as you're thinking about the topics we're talking about tonight, think about the kinds of questions you'd like to ask. Our, our next presentation is by Dr. Saren Elden Megamar. His teaching specialties include modern historical Mongolian morphology, Mongolian as a foreign language, classical Mongolian script, and translation theory. He's the author of numerous books, research articles, and translations. His PhD is from Mongolian State University of Education in Alambara, Mongolia. He's the president of the Mongolian Culture Center in Arlington, Virginia. His topic tonight is history and culture of Mongolia. Thank you very much. And uh, um, as a Mongolian language and culture teacher, I always appreciate this, all the possibilities, opportunities to talk about Mongolian history and culture and language to any uh, American audience. So thank you very much for giving us this uh, opportunity. So um, I, what I expect today is I thought it's more like young students will come here. So I, I prepared here a very brief introduction. So here I see the academic. So if it's too uh, no, level is in uh, <laughs> too low, please excuse me. I'm sorry. Excuse me, please uh, uh, write your. Uh, if you ask the questions, then I can answer in your in the language. So let's suppose. Let's think it's like a, if we have here some uh, Mongolian studies course, and then it's. Uh, this is like scores, so it's, uh, I have questions. There. So for example, if it's uh, this, your score, if it's, if it's D, if you answer that question, who was the founder of Great Mongolian Empire? Okay, And then it's, everybody knows this. And the C level. So in the Hollywood animated movie uh, Mulan, the villains are some northern nomadic people. So most scholars believe that they're ancestors of Mongols. Who are they? So if you, if you listen to my ambassador's speeches, he already gave the answer. <laughs> so the B-level question, B. If you answer that one, you, have, you got B in Mongolian studies. <laughs> in November 2009, China applied to UNESCO and registered a certain Mongolian traditional musical art piece as a Chinese heritage. So that was the big debate at this moment in Mongolia. And then, so what was that? The later Mongolia has added their name. It's, it's actually it's a Mongolian cultural heritage. So what was that musical art? And then A level is the most hard, the hardest one. In 1981, Jugdur Dimdin the Mongolian citizen, became the first Mongolian and 101st world. And so you can see. Okay, so uh, after the, my uh, presentation, uh, uh, I hope you can all answer in these questions. <laughs> <laughs> so here this answer is Mulan. With Mulan, there's some fragments of Mulan. So uh, uh, as uh, ambassadors told, so let me make it very short, this uh, history part, because uh, uh, ambassador gave us a uh, very uh, excellent uh, uh, a brief uh, history about Mongolia. So the most uh, scholars believe that the uh, Hunnu people uh, are the Mongo ancestors of uh, Mongolia. They, were, they, li uh, they lived around us, uh, what we live uh, around here. It's very difficult to say what language they were speaking because it's, there's not much uh, documents left. It's only a few words in uh, Chinese uh, Kanji script uh, left. So we can't really say if it was the uh, Turkic or if it's uh, Mongolian speaking people, but the one thing is very sure, this, as a genetically is the Mongolians, the, the Hunnu was among ancestors to Mongolia. That's the one truth. So after Hunnu, there, there's uh, other statehoods in, the, during the, in the, what we have in the, here in, the, in the Mongolia, in the in Russia. We, before, we, in the communist period, we called in Mongolia, we had Central Asia, but now Central Asia is here in the Americas, instead more, the stunned country. So, here in the academic uh, world says in Russia as a Mongolian uh, tradition. So Great Mongolian Empire here, you already know that, uh, okay, Genghis Khan, here this is the Genghis Khan statue in the, uh, in the uh, center of the Ulaanbaatar in the government palace. There is a big, huge, the, the giant uh, statue of Genghis Khan here. The, he, see the cars here, and it's, uh, it's just in, uh, 15 kilometers from Ulaanbaatar. Yeah. 
So Great Mongolian Empire as a, uh, let's, let's brief it here, Mongols, uh, the, uh, Dr. Wells also told about how big it was, so let's skip this. Then under the Manchu, ambassador told us the history, then the revolution for independence. Those are the, our first ministers. So in December 29, 1911, Mongolia first declared our independence. That means it's the, there is so many countries that uh, declared independence and there is like, uh, now this made uh, our the world map, right? So as this fact, the Mongolia is the first independent country of the 20th century. There, there, so before China, they declared their republic. Two days ago, the Mongolia declared our independence from Manchu, not from China. It's they declared both the China and Mongolia de declared their independence from Manchu. That's, so it's, uh, theoretically, that means it's, Mongolia was never was under the China. Both were under the Manchu, and then they declared our independence. So that is a book again who the uh, eight book the, is, was the he was the, at this time this the Mongolian monarch the religious leader and then he led this revolution uh, uh, revolution this for independence. Then in the, uh, 1921 this uh, uh, revolution this uh, people's revolution and then after this Mongolia became the socialist uh, uh, country and then uh, there also the ambassador told us this uh, highlights about us uh, here some. Some good things, also some basic right issues, some bad things here, one party system, and land. And then this Jukter Tim Tingurak, the question was the, the, this, this is Mongolian, the first Mongolian astronaut, and 101st uh, world astronaut. Was the, that was in 1981, he, he went to the uh, space. So, so it's, uh, I'm just, I want to show this is during this communist time, there were advantages or disadvantages. These advantages came from this, between these two. Uh, the capitalist or socialist system, uh, there was like competing each other, right? And then it's like, because Mongolia was the communist country, the, all this communist uh, uh, half of that, like, you have to develop tools because we show to you what the capitalist is. So they also, all this kind of stuff that like, the astronauts or the other, this, uh, there's this modern schools, hospitals, they try to build this. Of course, there are lots of you now the, the problems, there's like rights, basic rights. So, so. So that's okay, not really outside. So here then it's a 1990 our democratic revolution and, and then as uh, ambassador told many times, there is a, that was the most important thing was a peaceful transformation. We all know that what happened in some other countries in Eastern European countries, but the peaceful transfer, transformation, that was the most important. Here there's this, all these uh, uh, demonstrations and marches in the, and so, Okay, so it's a, it's a brief history here, there, and then it's a Mongolian language. It's a many people interested was how the Mongolian language look like, and then it's Mongolian people. When we hear this, most Mongolian people are very offended because it's the most Americans, the regular Americans, ask them, okay, is Mongolian language more similar to Russian language or Chinese language? So that's <laughs> so. Please don't ask this again if she's made some Mongolian. It's a very different form of this. So, as you know, the Russian is in the Indo-European languages, and then Chinese in different their their own their own the language tree. Mongolian languages in the part of the Altaic languages. It's a, if theory if believes okay if it's not even if if it's branch, but it's very those three Mongolian and Tungus, uh, Manchu Tungus and Turkic languages were very similar. Those three languages, and also Mongolian languages, agglutinative language. It's very different from both China and Russia. It's, agglutinative language means we add these suffixes, and then all these small suffixes means some uh, uh, grammatical meanings. For example, yav is the root for the verb for go to go, and yavol that's the causative to make something go. Yavol sang past participle, the something that we made to go or sent. Oh, that's the plural, the some things that we made to go. <laughs> Ta, commutative case, with, with something that we sent or we made to go. And then I is the reflexive, with something that I myself sent to. <laughs> so it's like this, it's everything. So Mongolian words are much longer. In that perspective, Mongolian language is more similar to uh, from European languages, but if you know the, some, uh, study some Mong European languages, more similar to Finnish and Hungarian language. Because many other scholars believe that Altaic and Uralic, their lang those languages are the same three. And then so uh, Uralic languages are the uh, Hungarian and the Estonian, uh, Finnish, uh, Samoyed, those languages. 
Okay, so that's the how the Mongolian language looks like. And then, as a normal, it's this very interesting fact that uh, Mongolia has used, has developed, created their own writing system, more than 10 writing systems in our history. That was an amazing fact. And then all of this, uh, this uh, script systems, we had some documents they had left, some of them very rich, some of them very difficult to find some documents. But it's, uh, so for example, Ketang, Ketang, that was very short that the Mongolian uh, language that is in, uh, in this script, Ketang language. And then there in square script, is, which is shown here. Uh, this is the, this, those the script names, and that's the when it was uh, uh, created. And then clear script in 1648. That's in the, mostly in Western Mongolia. And then Soyim script. This square script is, is also well known in the world in the academic world. It's Pakba, big, the scholars call it Pakba script because it's the Pakba, the Lama, the monk, Pakba uh, created that one. And then, so this is the Yuan period, Kublai Khan's period. And then Soyim script, horizontal, horizontal square script, Vagindra script is in 1905. And then as Mongolia had uh, some experience to change to Latin script in 1930. And then finally in 1941, Cyrillic script. But I left here one most important script in the whole, in, the whole, in Mongolian history. Every time all this script comes out, then it's, they, they use it and then no more, they, they don't use it. Still, the, well, our original script is reused again. That is, we call Mongol Bichik, the Mongolian script. So it's, uh, we are not very sure that it's when it's exactly, we don't have exact date. It's maybe from 10 or 13th century, and until now, still we're using this script. So in 1941, there is the, uh, under the, the Russian influence, communist influence, to change the uh, system to Cyrillic. But now it's, uh, it's in Mongolia, there is uh, more people, we teach it in the uh, middle schools. And so in the new language law just uh, passed in uh, the, one, the last month, it says in 2025, at, so both Cyrillic and uh, Mongol Bichik, Mongolian script will be official, the 50-50 the use in the in Mongolian official use. Maybe after this, in uh, some years later, we could uh, change it back for, for good. But uh, <laughs> for now, it's difficult because it's uh, after, 19, uh, after 1941, it's already two, three generations, they don't know this. Uh, so this is the, how Mongol Bichik looks like. We write it from top to uh, down. This is the very famous uh, a Mongolian great imp Hans uh, uh, stamp. Stamp, it's, uh, uh, we don't, unfortunately we don't, uh, f uh, we couldn't find our real stamp, but the uh, fortunate thing is that this, the, this stamp uh, is uh, kept in the one uh, uh, document letter written by Mongolian Khan, Guik Khan, Chinggis Khan's grandson, Guik to the uh, Roman Pope, uh, that uh, stamp is. This is actually the same word is written here, it's Mongol. That's Mongol, M-O-N-G-O-L. So here it is the same thing, this calligraphy. That's M, that round is O, O, N, G. And that round here is another O, Mong, and then that's L, Mongol. Wow. <laughs> nice, right? <laughs> so for the art and culture, it's uh, just uh, two things is, uh, let me just introduce. So we, we can say lots of the Buddhist influence, socialist influence, or so many things, but the, the root, real root is, lies on the, this nomadism and animal husbandry. So here, this is Mongolian uh, gear, we call it Mongolian gear, and then here, animal husbandry, five important animals. So all Mongolian art and culture performance, everything is connected to the, the, that uh, way of life. And uh, fortunate we have today, we, we will have the nice, uh, Small, uh, small concert, small performance. You can uh, uh, see, so you, you can have some taste of Mongolian uh, art and culture. So, for example, if, if I give you some examples, of Humi, throat singing, that was the one this, this China declared <laughs> under their name, this Humi. So, Humi is mostly famous in Western Mongolia. It's uh, most people in Humi they, Humi, they do Humi throat singing in the high mountainous area, the Altaic mountainous area in, in Mongolia. So, it's uh, way of the, the most is derivated from because it's uh, they try to the follow imitate their this uh, the high uh, mountain the uh, the 
uh, river sounds in the high mountains, etc., and then the homi is derivated. So it's uh, not many people in the steppe area uh, sing uh, homi. So the homi is the throat singing, and the Mongolian long songs. The steppe people in Mongolia is they have their own uh, uh, song, long song. So both in homi and long song, if you try to yourself, you just search in the YouTube, it's, you will see it's lots of uh, uh, nice examples, nice videos. There. Long song is like as, uh, when the people are in the steppe, there's no the like uh, uh, no mountains, no not even the small uh, uh, hills, and then this this song is like goes like way to around. <laughs> so some people say the long song can reach the space Mongolian long song, <laughs> and then Mongolian dance is uh, today we will have Mongolian dance. We have today a nice dancer from uh, uh, Washington DC Mongolian Cultural Center, and then that picture is her actual picture, and then so dance is also imitating this the way of the life, this nomadic way of life. You will see it tonight. And then this Marunghor is called this horse head fiddle. That's, that's the Marunghor. And again, today we have professional Marunghor players. Today we will uh, 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 listen to his performance. And then there's, there's a, the Mar the especially in those five animals, the horse is very important to Mongolian life. The Mongolian, both Mongolian cultures, any uh, aspect of Mongolian life. The Mongolians like to say, for example, in the, if it's a war, the horse is the most important one. Yeah? So it's, they like to say, compared this, it's a tank. And then it's, uh, when it's, uh, uh, you feel some love someone, to, you go to, to, to your loved one, you choose your most beautiful horse, and then you go there. It's like, maybe if here, like limousine or sport car, it's less than what's car. That's your car. And then when you, when you drink alcohol, that's actually from mere milk. There's a, we call it Eirek. Some uh, in uh, in uh, in a uh, Turkic country is a kumis. So our alcoholic drink is the uh, is from the horse. And then this music, this real original, uh, real original marunghor is made of the the string is made of the horse uh, hair and the horse uh, uh, tail and also box was made in the horse skin. But it's uh, now it's kind of modernized. Now the latest versions are this like more wooden wooden box. So the music is also horse. So it's, see, it's like it's your, war, your love in the horse and your <laughs> war in the horse. And music, even in the very difficult in the period in the time, in the, in the winter period, that's, uh, the horse meat is also possible to eat. So it's, there's all these uh, things uh, it's, uh, connected to the uh, horse. So, and uh, at the end, let me, at the end of my presentation, let me show you one thing that, uh, uh, Pre Ambassador uh, told you that uh, uh, President Bush visited Mongolia, right? So, the, in the prior to the President Bush went to Mongolia, there's some uh, 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 American uh, U.S. Uh, media uh, sent their own people. Uh, so, who, where the, the, the president are going? Yeah? They, so, the George Lewis, he's from uh, uh, Mongolia. Uh, he's from NBC. So he. Before he said, when I told friends that I'd be going to Mongolia, the reaction was almost anonymous. Wow, what an adventure. No doubt they imagined me in some sort of exotic outpost, the country of Genghis Khan, of lonely nomadic people herding their animals across the vast hillsides of camel caravans crossing the Gobi Desert. So that was his uh, idea, or, or at least his friend's idea. So he went to Mongolia, and then he saw it himself, and then he came back, and then he wrote that. Wow, so many surprises. I find myself rooting for these people and make a promise to return, preferably at a warmer time of the year. <laughs> for me, though, the warmth of the Mongolians is always in season. So most important thing here is he named his article, yes, land of nomads is isolated and exotic, but also very 21st century. And at the end, let me say my uh, a Mongolian proverb for you. It's like everybody here, students, academics. We have a, a proverb that we call the Meng Son Shor Nigut. That means you better watch just once instead of hearing a thousand times. <laughs> so if you go to yourself, Mongolia, you can see this very interesting nomadic way of life uh, in the countryside, also very 21st century in Ulaanbaatar. So, Go to Mongolia. Welcome to Mongolia.
Thank you, Saren. Her next presentation is by Alta Saldanem Sadan. She has more than 15 years of experience as a manager, policy analyst, and researcher in strategic management, business development, institutional assessment, and higher education. Since 2011, she has been a project coordinator of the World Bank. Her MBA is from Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. Her presentation tonight is Mongolia, Economy, Business, and Culture. So, good evening, and thank you very much for uh, hosting me and also for giving me an opportunity to present about uh, economy, business, and culture of Mongolia. So uh, my name is Altan Tetek, but my nickname or short name is Alta. Actually, my name is a Mongolian name. So if you translate my name into English language, it becomes golden flower. But my um, father's name or family name is Sotnom Tsereng, which is a Tibetan name. And I really don't know the meaning of uh, my <laughs> family name. I'm very sorry. Um, Okay, so this is what I'm going to say uh, today, and I will talk a little bit about Mongolian business environment, and I also will give a brief introduction to two key economic uh, sectors, livestock industry and mining sector, and also give some information about foreign direct investment. I will try to save some time to introduce to business culture, not Mongolian, uh, not like, you know, uh, Saro's uh, uh, talk about the Mongolian culture. It's a bit different. Okay, just I will escape this slide because uh, uh, His Excellency already introduced about the political situation in transformation from a planned economy to a market economy. Just I wanted to say that today we have the president from a democratic party who is Tsahaging Ilbek Dorj. Uh, Tsahaging Ilbek Dorj is now uh, talking a lot about the smart government. So this is the, the concept about the inclusive society and the participation of citizens in decision making. So it's a very big um, a concept and I think that all the government organizations are now talking about uh, smart government, including my organization, National Statistical Office of Mongolia. The current Prime Minister is also, uh, current Prime Minister Saihan Bilek is also from a Democratic Party. And uh, we call, uh, the, the current government is actually called the decision government because uh, before that we had another government between 2012 and 14, and then it was uh, resigned last year. And many of the decisions have been postponed and many of the, of the projects have been delayed uh, due to the uh, slow decision making of the government, that's why the Saihan Bilek say that his government will be actually the decision government. Yeah. So this is a very, inter uh, very interesting um, uh, data about the members of state grid or the Parliament of Mongolia. You see that the number of female members in the in the parliament is increasing in too far after the 2012 election we now have 11 members of parliament who are women members this is the thanks to the um, uh, um, amendment to the election law according to the provision in the election law 20% uh, of the candidates from any party for the parliament election shall be the women candidates so thanks to that provision we now have more women in the high level, in the um, policy making and the uh, uh, law making uh, 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 parliament. Yeah? So this is about the population growth of Mongolia. As you see that in, in 1921, we just had 650,000 people. And uh, now we have the th uh, three million citizens uh, was born in January 2015. So you see that the, uh, the couple is a very young couple. The couple is from the South Gobi Aymak. They are 21, 20 years old. And uh, that's the baby girl, and the name was given the, by the president of Mongolia. So the girl has a name, Mongolian, which means also Mongolian girl, you know? <laughs> yeah, very nice name given by the president. So just I would like to say that we had the one million cities in 1962, and the, the two million uh, 
citizen of Mongolia was born in 1988. So after 26 in seven years, we got the three million citizens of Mongolia. So it was very exciting news for all Mongolians this year and we celebrated this event very, very uh, broadly throughout the country, I should say. So as you see that, you know, the graph shows that there was a decrease of the population growth during 1992 in 2004. This is actually the transition period when Mongolia experienced, experienced a hard time, including supply of food, clothing, and all these things, and also many enterprises were privatized during that time. And also people lost jobs and unemployment was high. And also I should say that many of the uh, people uh, were laid down because you know their professions have just disappeared <laughs> during that period, including myself. <laughs> and I, because I graduated from, the, from a university in the Soviet Union, I supposed to become the kind of leader of Mongolian youth a socialist organization, <laughs> but when I graduated from the university in the Soviet Union, uh, there was no profession like that leader of Mongolian communist um, youth organization. It wasn't there anymore, so I shifted to a business administration, and I think that it was successful transition for me. <laughs> so this is about the composition of the Mongolian population. As you see that. About 70% of the Mongolian population is actually under 35 years old. So Mongolia is a very, very young country. As you see that in contrast to developed countries, only 4% of the Mongolian population are actually over 60 years old. So we are actually not facing the problems of aging, but we should consider them, you know. <laughs> so I should also say that life expectancy of Mongolians is uh, uh, 67 years old. For women, it's uh, uh, 70 years old, but uh, for men, it's a, a little bit shorter, 64 years old, I think. <laughs> so, um, so we, uh, according to the National Statistical Office statistics, in 2014, there were 823,000 households in Mongolia. So uh, two-thirds of them actually live in, in cities. And so it's very interesting that people just think that Mongolia is a nomadic country or it's a country where just there are just rural people, but actually not many of the people live actually in the city. I should also say that uh, we have just very one very big city, which is the capital city of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, and we also have two other cities, Erdenet and Darhan. And then we have uh, IMAX centers, like uh, IMAX centers means actually uh, provincial centers. Yeah. So this shows the, the proportion of urban and rural population. As you see that throughout uh, uh, between 2011 and 14, there is almost two, two thirds of the population actually are uh, urban population. Yeah. And also in these two pictures, I tried to show how different their life in the countryside in Lambato city. One is the family uh, in, in the countryside living in a gear in the winter. This is the winter camp, I think, and the people uh, usually move uh, throughout the season. But uh, in the winter time, they just stay in one place. And uh, this is a kind of winter camp place near the mountain where we believe that it's much warmer than to stay and live in the open step. Yeah. So uh, with the transition, as the ambassador said, that we have seen some positive changes as well as we have seen some negative changes. So one of them is the divide between the poor and the rich. I should say that according to the World Bank estimation, the poverty level in Mongolia is 27.4%. So it is a little bit higher in the countryside and a little bit lower in Ulaanbaatar city. And also it is said that 40 families, 40 Mongolian families have net value of uh, 30 million US dollars. So another thing is inequality in consumption. I should say that about 10% of the richest people, uh, richest families' consumption is almost eight to 10 times higher than the consumption of the poorest families in Mongolia. Another thing is we have seen the increasing number of orphan children in Mongolia. So we 
Currently, according to NSO estimation, we have 39,000 orphan children, of which 10% are, have no mother and no father. The remaining 90% have at least one, uh, one parent. So there is also increasing number of female-headed households in Mongolia. We have about 80,000 uh, female-headed households, and, and also a quarter of them live in Ulaanbaatar city. So this shows the percentage of female-headed households in, in the number of total households. As you see that it's not uh, uh, decreasing very much, and just about 10 percent of these uh, of the total number of households are actually female-headed households. I should say that many of them have uh, children. Um, uh, some have three, four children, so it's a bit difficult for women to, to head the families, you know. And just about the economic situation in the country. So in 2040, we have seen the, uh, uh, the GDP growth of 7.8%. 7 7 this is the preliminary estimation. The final estimation will be um, released by, uh, I think, by the end of June and early July. GDP per capita is uh, about uh, 5,900 US dollars. I should say that every salary of Mongolian, uh, Mongolians is about 400 US dollars a month, and uh, current unemployment rate is actually 7.9 percent. So this shows the GDP growth uh, since 2011, since the third quarter of 2011. As the ambassador said, that we had have seen a very high GDP growth in in 2011. It was almost 20 percent. 19%, 19 19.7%, but it has decreased to the end of the third quarter, 2014, to 7%. And um, why it has happened is that we um, there was a uh, there was a slowdown of foreign direct investment flow to Mongolia. That's one reason, uh, and also there was the um, slowdown of the economic growth in China, which is the main. Imp uh, which is the country where, where we export most of the mining uh, mining commodities. So this is uh, very uh, this is actually affecting the Mongolian economy nowadays. So if you look at the industrial composition of the GDP, you see that you know agriculture makes uh, uh, also a good proportion of the industrial com composition of GDP, and the mining also makes uh, quite a high percentage of the GDP. As seen uh, from the figure, in 2013, mining made about 20% of the GDP. So these blue ones are actually mining, and those at the top, that appear, uh, uh, purple one, uh, is actually uh, livestock. So it's hardly, Mongolia can be said that it's an agricultural country or livestock country. It can be said like an economy based on natural resources, I would say. So this is another factor affecting the economic uh, situation in Mongolia. This is the exchange rate of foreign currencies. So you will see you you, you see here that U.S. dollar exchange rate against Mongolian rupee is increasing significantly, and nowadays the U.S. dollar uh, exchange rate is 1,960 or almost 2,000 Mongolian rupee, one U.S. dollar. So it means that if I can buy, for example, with 2,000 Mongolian Tugruk about 10 eggs, but with one US dollar I cannot buy anything here. So coming to the United States, States is becoming quite expensive for Mongolians, but coming to Mongolia might be not so expensive for <laughs> Americans. I, I believe so. <laughs> So this is about employment. So according to the statistics, we have about 1.2 million uh, economically active population, and uh, many of them are actually in Ulaanbaatar city. And as you see, that about 300,000 uh, people are employed uh, uh, in agriculture. Actually, we cannot say that we have fishing industry. Uh, also, uh, many uh, work in wholesale and retail. So if you look at the mining circle, mining industry, it employs about 40,000 people. So this is about, uh, uh, data about the foreign employees. 
As you see that we have uh, about 8,000 uh, foreigners working in Mongolia, and most of them are uh, from China and North Korea. You might be uh, interested why North Koreans are there in Mongolia. Actually, uh, North Korea was in the, in the same communist bloc together with uh, Mongolia and during that time. You probably remember the, the Korean War period during the, that time, many Mongolian families actually adopted uh, North Korean orphan children. And, and uh, from that period of time, we have a very good relations with North Korea, and we still we have some cultural and educational uh, government level relations with North Korea. So uh, North Koreans are now working uh, through the government agreement at the construction uh, industry of Mongolia. Chinese people also mostly work in the construction industry of Mongolia. And we have about 300 Americans working in different uh, industries, including mining and uh, auditing, accounting, management, as well as uh, in, uh, in, 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 in universities and colleges. I should say that we have uh, also high schools teaching all the subjects in English language, and also some of the universities offer uh, classes and programs in English language. We also have the five colleges which uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign university branches. There is a Korean uh, college and also there is American University in Mongolia. So in terms of schools, we have a British school, American School of Fulambatar, and there is international school and so on. So. You, you see that, you know, we are actually, for Mongolians, English is becoming the first foreign language. Before that, Russian used to be the first foreign language. About doing business in Mongolia, this is the international, of, international ranking of doing business in Mongolia. So according to the World Bank's report of 2014, Mongolia is rated number 76 of, uh, as the country, uh, is the best country for doing business. And also the World Bank report says that Mongolia stands, it stands at number 25 it, uh, it, uh, in, uh, as, uh, in, in terms of ease of starting a business. So it's not a bad criteria, I think. It, it just shows that we are in the middle, not the best, but uh, still, not, uh, still good, I think. So we also see that in 2014, the business register database of Mongolia registered about 113,000 enterprises, but only half of them are operating. Uh, others are not, uh, not active at all. And uh, most of the uh, operating enterprises are actually in Ulaanbaatar city. So you might be surprised at why there are so many enterprises, but why they are not active. You know, uh, in 2011 and 2012, when the economy was growing, and we have seen the, when we saw the very uh, positive impacts of mining in mining booming period, people just thought that there will be more opportunities to do business, and there will be more uh, 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 opportunities to supply service and goods to mining uh, companies. And there are many people established enterprises, but however, when the mining went down, these, uh, these small and uh, small businesses just became uh, inactive, I should say. Uh, for example, I also established one, <laughs> but didn't do anything with that one. So it happens, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for the next boom. <laughs> and uh, this is the number of livestock. You see that we have 52 million uh, heads of livestock, we say. This also shows the how um, uh, different um, uh, animals uh, have grown over the years. Over the years, so as you see that, you know, horses are also rising. The number of horses is rising, and the sheep and goat numbers are also rising. Why the there are there are. There, is, there are so many goats nowadays. It's Kashmir is also one of the main exports of Mongolia, and Kashmir products are quite popular in Mongolia as well as abroad. That's why our people tend to grow uh, goats more. Yeah. So this is about the mining impacts. As you see in this figure, uh, mining makes 20% of the GDP. 
and about 80% of export revenue comes from mining industry, and about 4.6% of the employment is actually in the mining industry too. So, but about the women and men in the mining sector, of course, it is everywhere in the world. Uh, just 20% of the of the work, uh, of the employees in the mining sector are actually uh, female, and uh, but national uh, uh, compared to national average, it's almost 25% low, low number. So yeah, the, the ambassador already talked about that main project, our Utah project. This is one of the largest gold and copper reserves in the world. So um, we are now discussing about the second phase of our Utah project, which is the construction of the underground mining, uh, underground mine. So you see the impacts of our Utah project on the Mongolian economy, like you know, US dollar six point more than six billion US dollar investment, and the revenue exceeding one point three billion, and procurement from many Mongolian companies, uh, like three hundred million US dollars procurement. So I thought also I will can be also supplier to a Utah project, but it did not happen at all. <laughs> So also they make a great contribution to the local economic development too. So this shows the foreign direct investment in the Mongolian economy between 1990 and 2013. As you see that most of the foreign direct investment, about more than 70% of them goes actually into the geology and mining, and the next one is trade and hospitality, I should say. This is the number of foreign invested companies in Mongolia. As you see that there was the two, uh, two uh, uh, period when there was a, a very uh, high growth of foreign investor companies in Mongolia. One is 2007, this is just before the global <coughs> financial crisis. Many, many foreign companies came to Mongolia. And next one is when we, uh, when we signed the contract with, Ayutola, with Rio Tinto about starting the Ayutola project. So you see that 2011, in 2011, we had 933 foreign companies who came to, uh, came to invest into the Mongolian economy. They also believed that there would be very good positive impacts of doing business in Mongolia, thanks to a youth law project. Now the, the decline is so much that three times less number of foreign invested companies in, in, in the Mongolian economy. So just briefly about the people and culture, because already it was spoken. So nomadic way of lifestyle, I shouldn't say anything more. I cannot say anything more uh, than uh, Saro said. So I should only just say that there, there are, of course, differences. There aren't many comforts of, li of, comforts of city life, but people are very kind and hospitable and respect and help foreigners. And this is a very calm and nice and peaceful life, which is the people's lifestyle is very close to nature and to livestock, and, and people are close to each other. Such a nice uh, life, I should say. So I should say that Mongolia is a blend of old and new. So you see that how people live here. If we, when we talk about the livestock industry or animal husbandry, it should we, you should you you should not imagine about intensive livestock industry. It's actually family-based uh, business, I should say. So we milk actually not only cows. We milk also goats and sheep. Even we milk the you know <laughs> to get uh, and do some uh, tea. And then also, uh, herders' families usually have dogs, and dogs are a, a lot of help to families. And when uh, when guests come, usually people come out, come and uh, uh, you know uh, watch the dog to greet the guests. That's one of the tradition in Mongolia. So in in uh, that's the sum is actually county, I should say. This is a very small place, and the uh, average size of sum is actually about. Um, um, uh, 4,600 square kilometers, and every sum has about 3 million, 3,000 3, um, uh, people. So, uh, can shops and canteens are small, but uh, they are enough uh, for for the people uh, living in the countryside. This is also meat preparation in the countryside, and uh, this is actually 
uh, the the photo, the picture which I uh, took is a part of my sewing in the countryside. So meat preparation usually takes place at the end of November or beginning at the end of October or November. I should say there are, there are middlemen who go there and get all this meat from uh, herders and bring to sell, resell in, in, in the city. So, but living and working in Ulaanbaatar is such a, di such a different thing, I should say. So according to the story, it says that the cost of apartment is 12 times more than the yearly income of individual in Ulaanbaatar city. So you also see here that the average house price in compared to average annual income in China is 35 times more, in Singapore 18 times, in the third country is Mongolia 12 times higher cost of apartment, yeah? So it's increasing, yeah? So I also should say that Mongolians are opting to the Western culture, and you, especially young people, they now speak many foreign languages, including English, Russian, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. Many of them speak at least two foreign languages. And as, as young people, they are interested in Western music, fashion, and they follow all these things, YouTube, Facebook, or whatever. <laughs> and I should also say that women are very hardworking and well-educated, educated, uh, and also, um, but I should say that most of the higher uh, top management positions are held actually by men. So about the personality of Mongolians, we, can, we do not say that Mongolians are Asian people. We usually say that Mongolians are half European and half uh, Asian like, uh, is in terms of personality. And I should also say that Mongolians have a lot of pride and they don't like when, they, when people make joke about Mongolians or Chinggis Khan or horses. They love just horses. So, you shouldn't do. <laughs> and I uh, quite straightforward people. Uh, they are hardworking because uh, their life is not so easy in Mongolia, but not like Chinese or Vietnamese or uh, even Korean people, you know. We don't like just working for money. Uh, Mongolians like to work as a part of a team uh, for socialization, for meeting people, for networking, you know, even for development. So it's a, a little bit different from just working for money, I should say. Not very disciplinary <laughs> because we are, we, are, we are nomadic people and we are not very uh, much concerned about the time, I should say. We are changing, but still uh, sometimes we are late <laughs> for, for even very important events. <laughs> so we are also very good at languages, I should say. And the important thing about uh, being in Mongolia and working in Mongolia is that we usually uh, drink and eat out together on Fridays is a part of, uh, of, uh, the, of, of the team. I should say that Mongolians are more present-oriented, not future-oriented. It means that we, we cons uh, so just an example is that, you know, we like to spend money especially during a holidays like Mongolian Zona New Year celebration, we just buy everything. It doesn't matter whether we will save money for the next day or not. We just <laughs> spend because we really want to celebrate, you know. So we also like joking, but no jokes about Genghis Khan or <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> so about welcoming foreigners, foreign business is welcomed. And uh, also we like when foreigners love Mongolia and admire Mongolia and appreciate Mongolia. And also we, be, we are very um, easy, uh, for us it's easy to work with foreigners, I should say. But as any country, we also have some uh, um, movements against uh, foreign investment and foreign uh, nationalities and also we have some hate groups too. So about religion is business, we actually don't, don't like to mix religion with business, but still there are some days where we don't want to work, for example, or to start something, you know, for example, we don't like to start new business on Tuesdays or, or on, sun, on Saturdays. And for some people, it's even, uh, they don't like to, to cut hair on Tuesdays or Saturdays. We just believe that those days are, days are not so good. 
And also, sometimes I, when I uh, have to travel on Tuesdays or Saturdays, I even feel a little bit fair <laughs> inside me, you know, oh, not to go, not to fly on Tuesdays. Oh, no. <laughs> sometimes there is the feeling that, you know, Tuesday is not a good day <laughs> for me. <laughs> so um, this is just something, you know, uh, about the hierarchy and business. Yeah, of course, we have a hierarchy in business. It's important. It's, you know, we, it's because we also respect the elder people very much. So we try to uh, shake hands who is in a higher position first and give the business cards first to a person who holds a higher position too. Um, yeah, something like that also in common. And so I think that I've uh, said uh, enough about them. Uh, so one of the important things of doing business in Mongolia is the socialization. Mongolians like to socialize, you know. It means that business, the people doing business in Mongolia should think about organizing social events. Like, you know, we celebrate New Year. It's, it's compulsory to celebrate New Year together with employees. <laughs> and also, also we have some seasonal events like, you know, snow day or something like that. All the all employees go together and also have some competition or just eat out, something like that. Sometimes foreign business people do not consider that the Mongolian New Year, New Year is so important to, to be together. But so it's, it's the way how we work, you know, building trust, so it's a small country, people know each other, very population-wise, I should say. So uh, it's very important to make friends in the society so that these people spread about your business. And personal recommendations in network is, are also very important. So if somebody says bad words about the business or good words about the business, next day maybe everybody will know about, about that business too. So. This is the question we usually ask. Do you think Mongolian culture can present opportunities for doing business? Some people say that nomadic life is very good because it, it, is, it, it also gives Mongolians to be adaptive. Being nomadic requires flexibility and adaptation. So it's the benefit for changing policies or, or for introducing new things into the business. Some next question is, do you think Mongolian culture can present challenges for business? Some say that, yes, it's a challenge because we accept hierarchy and subordinate themselves uh, from the tradition of respecting elders. Maybe accepting others means you wait until decisions come from the top. No, not much creativity and innovation. Some people say so, we don't know. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. So just think about that. Next question is, are you ready? What strengths do you have? What may challenge you? So to, to stay in Mongolia, to live in Mongolia, or to do business in Mongolia is that, you know. There's, there's, some people say that there should be experience from previous work, studying or working or living abroad, leadership motivation, integrating with different people, cultures, and types of business organizations, self-reliance, independence, and all these things matter when you go abroad. But I believe that such kind of exchange, such kind of lecture series also will open opportunities to people and students, and I think that it's a very good thing to start going abroad, going to Mongolia. And this is my brief presentation about everything, economy, business, and culture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Autumn. Our last presentation. is by Dr. Jay Nathan, who is passionate about international business development in poor and emerging countries. In 2008, he was a Fulbright Senior Specialist to Mongolia. He has also served as a visiting professor to the National University of Mongolia, has published several research papers on Mongolia, and is a member of the American Center for Mongolian Studies. 
His PhD is from the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio. His topic tonight is entrepreneurship, culture, and regional differences. Hey, thank you, Dean Welsh, for the kind introduction. I want to be brief for the lack of time. And as you can see, my recent research is focused upon entrepreneurship in Mongolia that also includes culture. And that was also touched upon my earlier speaker, uh, Alta and Nakmiak Mar, as well as uh, His Excellency. Now, as you have heard, that Mongolia historically, even presently, has this nomadic lifestyle. And the question that Alta posed to all of us, can culture be a challenge to business? And I think this question, you know, I teach international business, and of course, the different cultures are pro-business, and it's natural for some culture to be entrepreneurial, and for some, uh, could be a little bit more challenging. And um, I think I want to bring a few things and then uh, skip a few slides. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, from historical as well as the books I bought while I was in Ulaanbaatar, which is, of course, the capital city where more than half the population of Mongolians live. Ulan means red, Batar means hero. And uh, uh, of course, we can even speak about the capital city, but that's not the point of discussion. Now, this is something I try to pronounce as much as I can or as close as um, our native speakers, yik sazak. Now that means it's a law, it's a tradition. So the core of the Mongolian tradition is Timujin, and that's the name of Chinggis Khan. I think most of the Anglicized say Genghis, but it's not, as um, His Excellency pointed out, Chinggis. And, uh, and you see double A's, the emperor, and uh, so, of course, they're consolidating the various um, uh, states or countries is not an easy task. And I'm a management, whatever you call it, teacher, and, I, and uh, of course, I enjoy being in the classroom. I get energy from students. And I think we are all managers, and managing a family, managing everyday life is itself challenging. But See, how did um, uh, um, the Ching, uh, Emperor Chinggis Khan did that? Now, of course, you gotta have a state organization, budget, civil duties, defense, all these were in existence. And um, so there is another core concept, which, which are the blue sky, and I had another presentation on Mongolian blue sky. And um, blue sky, um, father, and earth, mother. And that has a significance to all of us, of course. Uh, that brings to the notion of we are all offsprings from nature mother, and uh, live according to its law. Love and worship. For Mongolians, natural force is a power of eternal heaven. Intellectual heritage, this is something sometimes uh, underestimated, perhaps uh, misunderstood, perhaps not aware. Um, so we have mathematicians and even the family arithmetic and certain concepts are, uh, uh, of course, um, very much, <laughs> very much uh, revered, respected, and cultivated. And so uh, you see, acquire wisdom through education. This is part and parcel of Mongolian life, family, as well as uh, the people as a whole. And then I'm going to uh, skip a few slides. Please allow me for the lack of time. And, um, and so um, and I did a survey briefly 2012 and then extended 2013. This, what you see before you, was also translated to Mongolian. And um, I had, of course, 
um, help and, and the former provost of National University of Mongolia, uh, through his assistant, distributed to various provinces. They call it IMAX. And, and I want to give briefly um, the place of business. As you can see, it's um, 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 rural is 23%, urban is 77%. And as far as the gender, as you can see, that 69% um, uh, the female run different types of businesses. And highest level of education. Uh, you see here the graduate high school elementary, and I'm sorry it is uh, sometimes the numbers are not clear, but then you can clearly see that, um, um, that more and more education of various levels are uh, of course, uh, acquire and also um, be part of the life and also the attitude. Learning is part of the Mongolian culture. Now, the question, uh, of course, some of the questions that were posed, but I'm going to pose a different question, starting a business. Now, we take it for granted in the United States, you go to the internet and then you start a business within 24 hours and you, you got a legal business entity. And uh, sometimes, uh, yes, starting a business is also relatively, um, uh, it's, it's also relatively easier. And, um, but then you have a question, inherited or newly started? So you find 84% newly started. As you know, nomadic lifestyle and having a livestock as a major portion of the economy and slowly um, the transition nature and moving into the modern in the sense of the products and services that we see that's present in many of the modern economies. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to skip a few slides about the culture, relationship to the culture and the products. So you find here that maybe the next, okay, does the business relate to the culture? And as you can see on this slide, that um, the no is the big bar. That means almost 60, 65% or close to 70%. So, uh, uh, so that's one, one element captured in the survey. And again, you can see the same thing, again, on the different, uh, in terms of uh, a graphic presentation. And the year started, and again, um, um, how long the business has existed and been around. And again, you see that uh, in 2000, and years and 10, uh, how long, 10 years has been in business, um, um, continuation of the business. That's, those are some of the good things, but then it slows down. So to, uh, to just to close this, uh, let me um, point out a couple of things. Who are the customers? As you can see here, that you have families or the major consumers uh, products, and then you have women, men, and it's kind of a, a five different uh, segments, as you can see here. Uh, again, the same thing. Okay, now I, I mentioned about IMAX, which are provinces. So there are 21 IMAX that are differences. Again, that's true with the United States in many countries, north, south, east, west. So um, that is also uh, is true in Mongolia. Now I captured the index of development, but again you see Ulaanbaatar, capital city, and as you can see, um, these two regions, and they have a significant development. There are other regions which are less in terms of um, development. Okay. Now, in closing, what about the future? Someone asked during our luncheon presentation with the deans, what is 25 years from now? Uh, in the presentation yesterday, or some of the cultural, um, in fact, of elements, surveys in many countries, the question is about, are you present oriented? Do you plan for the future? And there is something that the, the, the present the younger population, they travel a lot and they get education, business and other, and they travel to Western countries. And so you find more and more young Mongolians go for higher education and training. And they are eager to participate 
even though the economy has slowed down a little bit the last two years, of course the mining, which is a major portion of the economy, but then I think the vibrancy of democracy, and again, it's a landlocked country. When you put Germany and France together, that's about the size, and so it's a, it's a fairly large land mass, but then uh, three million people and they would offer to the three million, the baby girl, okay? I cannot thank you enough, all of you, and we have excellent musical presentation, and then Q&A, and I want to transfer and turn over to Dean Welsh. Thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for all four of our presenters, please? For our presenters, we'll uh, return to the stage. Uh, we'll now do Q&A. Again, if you've written a question down, uh, Kim will walk down this aisle, and uh, I'll over here. Alrighty, uh, we have uh, a couple of questions here. Um, Mr. Ambassador, we're going to start with you, okay? You mentioned that the Mongolian government is interested in developing Mongol Mon Mongolia, including bringing greater access to technologies, education, and exploitation. Will this tradition, will this allow traditional nomadic lifestyles to continue? Or does this include a using of a more sedentary Mongolia? I mentioned that one of the main purposes of uh, Mongolian government uh, to create society based uh, on knowledge and modern technology. But the uh, Mongolian society is still very nomadic. And nomadic culture, nomadic uh, type of life, living is a very, very important. I would like to say you that uh, we really would like to preserve our uh, nomadic culture. And I again uh, tell you that uh, Today, uh, almost uh, half of population of uh, Mongols, they are living still the traditional tents, you know. And in the countryside, it is really, you know, very uh, uh, flexible. And even in modern uh, time, uh, the nomadic people, they don't want to change this uh, uh, tent, you know, because it is a very uh, flexible, it is a very uh, traditional when you have animal husbandry. And that's why, you know, by taking, by developing our society uh, in the modern way, based on technology, but uh, we are at the same time giving great importance to preserve our traditional uh, living style. So this is, you know, something, you know, uh, uh, not ignoring each other. And that's why this uh, tradition culture is very, very important for, to preserve. And I would like to say that. Thank you. 
Anybody else like to add to the ambassador's comments? Okay, then all have a question for you. Is the Mongolian government concerned about economic and environmental exploitation by foreign corporations in the mining sector? And what steps is the government taking to prevent this? So I should say that this is the very um, hot topic among uh, parliament members, among the government, uh, high level officials, even between the uh, local community and uh, the government, even between the local community and foreign companies. This is because, you know, livestock is, uh, is the industry that uses the pasture land. Mining is the industry that really destroys the pasture land. So that's why there is, the, there is the conflict between the local community and also the foreign companies. Of course, we see that economic benefits of the mining company, but we really cannot ignore our traditional way of living. And also we cannot ignore the local community. So um, that's why, why there is the delay of so many mining projects is that one of the reasons is actually this conflict between the, these uh, companies and local community, I should say. Would anybody so, else like to add? Um, also, just one thing to add is that I used to do the research on impacts of mining on the environment, and I should say that, of course, there is a big uh, a negative impact uh, of mining on the environment, and also it uh, also uh, impacts on uh, tourism, uh, um, nature, and, uh, and the most of these mining uh, sites are actually in very remote areas, in very nice places, including uh, forest areas and very nice uh, mountain areas, or it's in the uh, in the Gobi Desert, which is one of the very uh, popular places for tourism. So, uh, it's also mining also use a lot of water. If you if you know about the desert, you know using water in the desert and how it's just underground water. So there is a concern about it. But we believe that mining also will bring benefits and also mining will use the most efficient and most environmentally friendly technology. That's what we believe in. Would anyone else like to add? Okay. Sorry, this question is for you. Is there any type of formal education available to the children of rural or nomadic families? Yes, it's, uh, actually, it's, um, the literacy in the presentation. Did you you saw that the literacy in the around the socialist time? So it's a uh, Mongolian literacy is very high. Also, almost reached a uh, hundred percent. Uh, that at this time it was the uh, in the under this uh, we can say like dictatorship maybe in this area. This it was easy. This the law says the kids have to the in the rural the nomadic kids have to go to attend the school one hundred percent. So they must send the school. So it was uh, in the uh, the good side of that policy was the, the literacy was very high. Nowadays, it's very difficult. Nowadays, it's uh, um, difficult. It's, uh, for example, some families has like thousands of animals, and they don't want, to, they have they someone to help. The first thing is someone they need to help. The second one is they, they have need someone to inherit all these animals. So in for those two purposes, most times they choose the boys, the, the, the sons. That makes this, this see the, the, here this all this the, this graphics that uh, in the high school and also in the in the colleges and high education there are more girls or women is much higher. This uh, countryside is uh, tourism. So there's there's some uh, programs against this. For example, as uh, as uh, one is uh, very uh, successful ones I just had, uh, I saw it was this uh, uh, rural nomadic library. That was very interesting, nice uh, okay. programs. Nomadic library, they go to the rich, that is very beyond this, uh, the, the remote areas. But there is uh, no, no very sustainable good, uh, uh, like online or the distant, uh, the primary education system into the rural states. There is only one choice that they ha should send to their kids to the SOM center. SOM center, they can study there. And another small, another big problem is Mongolia changed our education system to 12-year system. 
So it's, uh, it's similar to Western countries, 12 year system. Before we had 10 year system, at this time, eight years we started and we uh, graduated in 18 years old. So it was good eight years kids to go to the SOM center, live in dormitory. Now new law says it's uh, to 12 years, it's six years old have to go to, have to leave the uh, home. The six years small, they have to live in dormitory to study. So that is another challenge, so. Thank you. The, the last question is for all four of you. Um, and you can sit there and draw straws to see who goes first. Uh, and I'm going to personalize this. Uh, so I do apologize to the person who wrote this question because I'm going to uh, put it in a, in, a, in a first person. I'm interested in visiting Mongolia. When should I come? Uh, once I get there, what are the five things I should do? And what's the one thing that you hope I don't see while I'm there? This question is for all of <laughs> But Jay, you can start. I will start. Well, I think first of all, uh, Mongolia is a, is a place that everyone um, should, uh, in a sense of, uh, begin with adventure and have the city and countryside. And even on the first day, that captured. And I even I didn't sleep as much in the first night, even though I was very tired. So that's one of the things. Um, adventure and also willing to um, uh, willing to be uh, experience the countryside and also I want to say third thing be live under the garb the Mongolian use instead of the term tent they live in a in a historically for centuries in a, a tent called girth G E R which is different from and some other Central Asian countries or other countries use the term. And I have lived at one of those, um, yes, mobile uh, dwelling, and those three things. And fourthly, of course, you should see Nadam Festival. And horse is very much part of the Mongolian culture. And it'll continue to be in the 21st, 22nd century, and that's loud to see, and also the children um, even on the horse, that's the thing. And finally, the language itself. And those are the five things on my take. Yeah. Um, uh, what should they say? Um, maybe uh, uh, just to avoid air pollution in Ulaanbaatar city, it might not be good to go to Mongolia uh, during the winter time. But if you are going to the countryside, any time is good. Some people come to Mongolia in the winter time to experience coldness, I should say. <laughs> and um, another, um, if I'm a foreigner, if I were a foreigner uh, visiting Mongolia, I would stay uh, in a Mongolian nomad family, kiss for one night, um, just to experience how people live and just, just to mix with the local people, I would say. Um, what, anything good? Ah, what I shouldn't see. <laughs> uh, that's interesting question. Um, uh, I think that um, sometimes, um, as a Mongolian, sometimes I feel a little bit embarrassed when people see a lot of. Uh, garbage uh, thrown uh, in a very nice uh, nature place. So <laughs> you should close your eyes. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe my suggestion is maybe you better to come to Mongolia five times instead of once in the five times. <laughs> so in your first visit, you go to, go to the south, visit uh, Gobi the second, second biggest desert in the, in the world, the Scobie Desert. Next time you go to Easter, you, if you go to the east of Mongolia, you will see steppe. There's nothing will, that will, uh, can enter you to your flat area, the steppe. 
Then the next visit, you go to western side. In the west, you see the Altaic and Hanga Mountains, this big mountainous area, Altaic Mountains. And then next time you go to north, and you'll see kind of Siberian style. In the Hovskul area, you'll see Taiga, how it looks like. So all four very different. And then fifth time you stay in Ulaanbaatar. And when you stay in Ulaanbaatar, as uh, Alta says, you better stay maybe in the uh, summertime, because it's uh, in a, uh, one thing you don't want to see is uh, in uh, air pollution in uh, winter, because it's, uh, as Ambatar says, there's a gear. Uh, half of the Mongolia Ulaanbaatar pollution in the gear. Every gear has to be be to uh, fire to set fire in order to be keep the uh, heat. Mr. Ambassador, the last question is this is you. Yes, uh, when you are visit Mongolia, please think that you are visiting untouched land. You are visiting nomadic land. So, when you are visit Mongolia, please first at least one day spend in Ger in the Mongolian tent, and you, you can feel what is this uh, nomad, nomadic life in the real life. Second, you can test Mongolian food, which is also very natural, very natural meat, very natural milk, milk production. And third, you can visit Mongolian uh, cultural event, which is also very unique. And it is nomad culture, it is not settler, settlers culture, in it, which is quite different. So, another, uh, you know, I would like to propose, if you really, uh, you know, uh, have some hobby, uh, is a hunter, it is a, one of the best place to hunt, to fish. So you can also use this opportunity. And uh, what I would like, uh, lastly, to tell you, um, maybe it is a, you know, uh, another thing, of course, you can try to ride a horse. Yeah. Because it is a really in, in integrated part of the Mongolian culture. In every, every people in Mongolia, boys, girls, and adults, and women, and men, they can, they must ride horse. And so you can try to ride horse, you know, and in order to enjoy. What is this horse riding race? Thank you. So, Thank you. <laughs>